Thank you very much, Madame Rajavi, distinguished colleagues, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure when I first learned about the massacres of 1988, but I heard a great deal about them a little more than a decade ago when I participated as one of the members of the Truth Commission uh, held in London, I think in 2012. Um, I sat on that commission with Louise Asmal, Eric David, uh, Daniel Turp, and others, and we listened for several days to testimony by witnesses, relatives of the victims, talking about the events in Iran in 1988. It's very gratifying today to see that that was part of a growing momentum uh, that is contributing eventually to what we hope will be justice for the crimes that were committed. One recalls Martin Luther King's marvelous metaphor about the moral arc of the universe tending towards justice. In my work with the United Nations over the years, I've devoted a great deal of attention to the issue of capital punishment. Every five years, the Secretary General of the United Nations produces a report on the status of capital punishment in the world, and I've been the principal author of that report uh, since 2009, 2010. Not everybody knows that over the recent decades, uh, the death penalty has largely disappeared on the planet and that the great majority of states in the world now have abolished capital punishment in their national legislation. Moreover, of those that remain a minority, the majority of that minority have stopped using it. And there are today fewer than 30 countries that still use the death penalty, some of them more frequently than others. We don't have statistics for all of them because we don't get the numbers of executions from China and Vietnam and North Korea. But of the rest, Iran sits at the top of the list. In fact, last year, Iran had as many executions as the rest of all the other executing countries combined. It has a, a huge predilection for capital punishment. I think that when the time comes to prosecute, to hold trials, that there will be useful circumstantial evidence, should the crimes of 1988 be denied, about the fact that since the day it started, since the day it took power, until the present day, this is a government and a regime with a thirst for capital punishment. Now today, most of the victims are actually not for political crimes, although I wouldn't want to uh, underestimate the significance of that even uh, at the present time. Most of them are for crimes relating to drug trafficking. They increase the number of executions year on year, and if nothing else, prove to us what a fake argument it is that the death penalty deters drug crimes, because if it actually did succeed in deterring them, we would expect the number of executions to decline from year to year, and that's not what's happening. In fact, what's going on, of course, is a message is being tr transmitted, above all to political opponents of the regime, that they put their lives on the line and that this is a regime that will stop at nothing to uh, quell dissent. Let me address a few of the legal points, not in detail. I don't want to be overly technical, but I want to talk about three issues relating to uh, the uh, qualification and the eventual prosecution of the crimes committed in 1988. Some speakers have already used the word genocide today. You know the definition of genocide in the United Nations Convention adopted in 1948 is a narrow one, and it's restricted to groups that are defined by as national, ethnic, racial, or religious. Political groups were deliberately excluded from the list for reasons that um, I'm not, I don't have time to explain today. But since then, there have been attempts to get international judges to 
read them into the Convention to expand the Convention's scope by interpreting broadly its words. But the message from judges, especially at the international level, has been, it's not for us to do this, it would require an amendment. And of course, an amendment would not apply retroactively. There are countries, France is one of them, that have adopted their own somewhat original definition of genocide and have included political groups within the list. In fact, the French legislation talks about groups defined by any arbitrary criterion. Tout critère arbitraire, says the French code penal. And so prosecution for genocide here and in other countries would be possible. But we will encounter arguments about retroactive prosecution of the law, as amongst others Lithuania did when it attempted to do this at the European Court of Human Rights. The second issue that may arise is the argument that prosecutions for events that happened 35 years ago or more are time barred. Prescription, prescription, as we call it, statutory limitation. We have an incomplete or poorly ratified treaty within the United Nations system that says that crimes against humanity cannot be subject to statutory limitation. And the draft treaty that Leila Sadat has been so deeply involved in preparing, and that is currently before the General Assembly of the United Nations, specifies that crimes against humanity are not subject to statutory limitation. Well, very few countries have ratified the original treaty, which was developed within the United Nations in the 1960s. And so we can't turn to the treaty as such. But when the vote was taken in the General Assembly in 1968 about the text of the treaty, which excludes, excludes statutory limitation in the case of crimes against humanity, Iran voted in favor of the text. And so I think that's the position that the state has taken, and it's one that it's very hard to retreat from. The, I think that those are the main issues. Perhaps there's one final issue that could arise in a debate about crimes against humanity committed in the, I don't want to say distant past, but several decades ago. When crimes against humanity were first prosecuted at Nuremberg in 1945 and 1946, the concept was limited to crimes and atrocities associated with an armed conflict. And for many decades, crimes against humanity was saddled with this limitation on its scope. That limitation very clearly in international law disappeared in the 1990s. But we're going to have an argument about whether the limitation still existed in 1988. I think there the answer is to be found in another treaty of the United Nations, the Convention Against Apartheid, which was adopted in the 1970s, in 1973. And of course, which deals with apartheid as a crime against humanity, clearly one committed in peacetime. And Iran, I think in 1985, ratified that treaty, the Convention Against Apartheid. So in my view, that too puts an end to any argument from Iran that it doesn't recognize crimes against humanity committed in peacetime. I was very moved by the video that we saw uh, a few minutes ago and about the testimony. Was I correct in thinking that he's sending this to us from Ashraf III in Albania? Uh, I think he referred to this at the very end. And uh, I will hope that when we have prosecutions at some point that there will be witnesses from Ashraf III who will participate in the trial and will testify. They are now within the jurisdiction of the European Convention of Human Rights on the territory of a state party to the European Convention on Human Rights, and they have all of the civil and political rights guaranteed by that treaty. Thank you very much. Thank you.